Good morning. Everybody doing all right this morning? Just wanted to say, if you missed Canoe in the Mountains this past Wednesday, you missed an excellent taco, amen, bar. Somebody, somebody came up to me in the line and said, man, this is one of the best taco bars I've ever been to. That's how good it was. So you're going to want to make the next one. Um, really, just a reminder, uh, we have Sunday school for all ages every Sunday morning. Uh, adults meet up in the top of the old building up over here. Uh, Miss Bernie's class is in the old sanctuary. And then, of course, kids. Kids are up here. And today I, today I saw them having Sunday school out on the back patio since it was so beautiful. So that was awesome to enjoy the day, too. Um, but come and be a part of that, and, and you'll be blessed. Uh, just one announcement, really a quick reminder. Next Sunday, the 25th, you're going to want to be here. We're going to have worship. We're going to have some testimonies. Uh, I think Shane's going to speak a little bit, if he told me right. Uh, and then afterwards, you're going to want to hang around. We're going to be playing some games and having some food and some family fun. And I'm just looking on here. It says hot dogs and hamburgers, slip and slide, kickball. Um, I think Jeff Benton is getting in a Duncan booth. And it, and it says family games. Or maybe Karen. I think we're going to put Karen in there this year. Uh, but anyway, that's it. So if you'll, bow, if you'll bow with me, we'll get started. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this beautiful day, Lord. Thank you for all those in attendance, Lord. We just love you and we praise you and we thank you for all the blessings in our church, Lord. We ask that you just that you be with the lost and, and Lord, that you uh, breast uh, bless brother Chris Wiley, who's come here to share with us this morning, and we just love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello. There we go. There we go. All right. So you. I don't need it. There's been a, a common occurrence these past few weeks, man, and that is that the Spirit is moving in Robertson County, okay? It is moving. So we got two more today that are giving their life to Christ. Absolutely. So first one, Greg, come on up, brother. Oh, doing it in socks all the in way. Socks. That's what I'm talking about. All right, so Greg here, he, he come in and he's just, you hear me say this every week, but it's, it's the truth. He's hungry. He's hungry for what the Spirit has to offer. So Greg, who is your Lord and Savior? God. Who died for you? Jesus. Amen. So today I, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Come here, brother. The next gentleman we have, his name is Jacob. And uh, Jacob, I'm, I'm going to tell a little bit about what we talked about the other day, if that's okay. All right, so come on on. So the other day, me and him were talking, and he said, you know, I, I've lived in all these other states, but the Lord keeps bringing me back to Tennessee. So, brother, where the Lord leads you, he's going to provide for you. So there's not going to be any, any question about are you doing the right thing? Are you, are you where you're supposed to be? Our God is not a God of mistakes. He has you right where you need to be. So, Jacob, who is your Lord and Savior today? God. Who died for your sins? God. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, brother. <laughs>
Hey, go and rise with us this morning. We've already had baptisms. I love the questions that he asked. He said, who are you? Who saved you? And the beauty of this is we all get to claim that promise, right? We are children of the Father. Sing with us. Walking the wayside, lost on a lonely road. Now I was chasing the high life, trying to satisfy my soul. All the lies I believed in left me crying like the rain. Then I saw I didn't from heaven. And I've never been the same. Here we go. I'm gonna climb the mountain. I'm gonna shout about it. I am a child of love. Yes, I am. I found a world of freedom. I found a friend of Jesus. I am a child of love. I felt the sting of the fire, and I saw you in the flame. When I thought it was over, you broke me out of that grave. I'm gonna sing. I'm gonna climb the mountain. I'm gonna shout about it. I am a child of love. Yes, I am. I found a world of freedom. I found a friend of Jesus. I am a child of love. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. I am a child of love. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. I am a child of love. Nothing can change.
was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Till I met you You called my name out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day Your mercy has saved my soul. And now your freedom is all that I know. The old man knew Jesus when I met you. You called my name. And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness And to your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness And to your glorious day Break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of hell. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call my name. Out of the darkness into your glorious day, you call my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. by it. Lord, help us today to worship you in spirit and truth. Bless the message and the messenger and everything be done to your glory. Lord, thank you for this church and the members. And Lord, may we just feel your presence today that we may worship you humbly and in spirit and truth. Thank you, Lord, for all the things that you've done for us. May we give back to you, Lord, that you may use it to, to further your kingdom and to glorify your name. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run fountain I drink from, oh, is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The 
ransom for my life. Oh, he is my son. You are good. The night he is holding on to me. God is holding on. And when the night is holding on to me, God is holding on. Bow with me, Lord God. Thank you for that. God, to know that, that this world is full of darkness, that there are so many things that can weigh us down, that can pull us into a dark place. But God, to know that you have given your son for us, Lord, to bring us into light. Amen. Lord, I just pray that this morning, if there's anybody that feels like they're wandering in darkness, God, that they would be able to just, just cling to the hem of his garment, God, just to be touched just to reach out for Him and feel that peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, just the, the infinite joy that comes from You. God, let us never walk in darkness, but let us always walk in the light with You. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no way, rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't 
say, let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and His grace is free. And the good news is I know that He can do for you what He's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. about my Jesus and all the wrong turns that you would go and undo if you could who can work it all for your good let me tell you about my Jesus he makes the way where there ain't no way rises up from an empty grave ain't no sinner that he can't save let me tell you about my Jesus love is strong and his grace is free and the good news is i know that he can do for you what he's done for me let me tell you about my jesus and let my jesus change your life hallelujah hallelujah guilty who would care that much about me let me tell you about my Jesus oh. he makes a way where there ain't no way rises up from an empty grave ain't no sinner that he can't save let me tell you about my Jesus his love is strong and his grace is free and the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. chorus back up. Let's all sing that together. One, two, three. He makes the way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And let my Jesus change your life. tell you right now if you don't know him you don't have to wait to the end come find one of us now find a deacon where's Jeff where's Dale where's Tommy myself find just find anybody on this stage if you want to pray hey, we'll pray with you right now we're not we don't have to wait we don't have to go in an order um, there is no need in sitting in misery and in darkness for the next half hour waiting till the time to come up to this altar uh, so find one of us but bow with me now for prayer Lord God thank you thank you for my Jesus 
Lord, thank you for allowing us as undeserving as we are, God, to just to call your name and to, to be adopted into your kingdom. God, I pray that, that anyone here this morning, Lord, that's hearing this, that can't claim you as their Lord and Savior. Lord, today, let that be the day. Let no one leave this building today without knowing who you are. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'll use it, trust me. <laughs> How's everybody doing? It's been a little bit since I've been here. I tell you, I was blessed this morning because my brother came over to me and he's like, man, I remember exactly what you preached last time you were here. And I thought, okay, well, let's, let's see this. Let's, let's see. And he goes, God's going to take you. God's going to bless you. God's going to break you, and then he's going to give you. And I went, dude, you got it. Like, that's it. So if you weren't here for that message, obviously you needed to be. You need to go back and watch the video. Uh, but I am so thankful to be here this morning. It may be a while before I get to go, come back, so uh, you guys are going to get a lot. So just get ready. Um, I, I have a, a board meeting that I'm supposed to be going to after service, so I'm going to preach long enough so I don't have to attend. So I'm just letting you know. Like, there's going to be a lot this morning. Everybody, everybody buckled in, ready to go, right? Good. Well, let's go ahead and stand and read the word, if you don't mind. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to start in verse 23. And I'm going to read through verse 29. So Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and that they were afraid. We're not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn may not touch them. And by faith, the people crossed the Red Sea on the dry land. But the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. You may be seated. Now, that is a resume. Everybody agree? Like, if I'm going to put that on paper, hey, uh, we're looking for a new person to lead us or a new person to, to uh, direct us or guide us or be our pastor, and I tell you, well, I was the one that uh, opened up the seas. I was the one that led uh, Israel out of Egypt. I was the one that turned Egypt's money away because I was going after Christ. You're like, yeah, this is the guy we want to lead us. So Moses has a really cool story he's he's a really good character saved at birth and placed in a basket at the edge of the river where his mother knew he would be found by the princess he was surrounded by all the right material to protect him and and, and he laid there and done so by faith and we just read because of they saw something different in him they saw something beautiful in him and so we see at the very beginning of his life the very thing that was meant to destroy him the Nile River is the very thing God used to keep him because God is that good amen and we'll see later in Moses's life that the water plays a very important role in in Moses's life so I'm going to take each of these events from Hebrews and kind of break them down for you just a little bit because when I read Scripture, I have this saying, you can't just read Scripture, you can't just read the Bible, you have to read the Bible. I'll say it one more time. You can't just read the Bible, you have to read the Bible. And you, you think, well, what, what do you mean by that, Pastor Chris? I mean, there is so much going on in Scripture that if you just give it a cursory look, you're going to miss it. And so I don't want to do that. I want to read the Bible. So when I was praying on what to preach on after, after Pastor Nick uh, sent me the, the message, 
I, w- I was like, okay, Lord, what, what do you want me to preach on? And, and, and I felt God say, I want you to preach on Moses. And, and the Lord and I kind of went back and forth on that because you all know, y'all are people too, and unless I'm the only one. Sometimes God gives you a directive and you're like, mm, is that God or is that me? And so the, we're sitting in a service and, and the pastor begins to preach on Moses. And I said, okay, Lord, uh, that's kind of a little bit of confirmation, but your word says two or three voices. So tomorrow when we come back to service, if the pastor begins to speak on Moses, that'll be the third voice. I know it's you that you want me to speak on Moses. So we're at a competition with our youth group. And in the competition, there's a short sermon section. And lo and behold, the moments that we're sitting in the short sermon, if there was one message about Moses, there was 20. And I said, Lord, that ain't exactly the deal that I gave you, but I'm, I'm listening. So we get to service that night. Everybody's sitting around. The pastor comes out. Worship was phenomenal. I'm not thinking anything about it. And all of a sudden, the pastor goes, hey, guys, I want to talk to you tonight about Moses. And I went, okay, Lord. I'm in, I'm in. So y'all can be assured that God has, this is what he wants you to hear this morning, okay? Because if I tried to fight him on it and he said, no, this is what you're preaching, then here it goes. Turning your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3, verse 2. I know some of you in here, you are lifelong Christians. You've been Christians since you came upon this earth. I understand. You've been saved. You've heard the Moses story and you, and you know it backwards and frontwards and inwards and outwards. Don't tune me out. Okay? I promise you there'll be something today that you can latch a hold of. Okay? So Exodus chapter 3, verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire. And from the midst of the bush, so he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. The angel of the Lord there, that terminology is called a theophany. And what that means is this is a pre-incarnate showing or pre-incarnate physical, visible nature of Jesus Christ coming to be. So before he's born of a virgin, he's in a flame in a bush. That's what this means. Sometimes we go to God and we're like, God, I need that burning bush moment. Anybody ever said that? Lord, if you would cut, like, Lord, I'm going down this path, but if it ain't you, I need you to tell me. And you don't hear nothing. You're like, okay, Lord, I don't know if you're just being silent or if you're testing me. If you'll give me a flaming bush, I promise I'll go wherever you want me to go. Right? If you'll do like the Old Testament, hand on the wall and write out, turn left here. I promise I'll turn left, but I really need that hand on the wall. And God says, just trust me. Amen? So Jesus Christ shows up. And we get back to that, uh, that, that moment, and, he's, and he tells Moses to take his shoes off. Don't come any closer, take your shoes off, because you're standing on holy ground. When my family and I went through uh, the book of Exodus, that kind of jumped out at me when I was teaching them, and I didn't really know why God would have somebody take their shoes off. And I, so I started looking and trying to figure something out, And nothing that I really saw kind of met, it it didn't satisfy my soul as to why God would do that. And I finally found an answer that satisfied me. Y'all want to know what it is? You'll find out at the end. So verse 4, so when the Lord saw, he turned... When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. There's a significance with God using Moses' name twice. When God calls you and he says your name twice, it is Egypt or uh, Israel Jewish teaching that it denotes intimacy. So I want you to think about that for just a moment. The first time that we hear God call to Moses, he calls his name twice. He says, Moses, Moses. We see that later when God is calling to to Samuel. In the middle of the night, he says, Samuel, Samuel. We see it when he talks to Paul, when he talks to Martha, when he talks to Jacob, when, when he talks to Peter. God uses these moments to call people's names twice because he's telling them, I want a deeper relationship with you. I want it to be more intimate. And so he calls his name Moses, Moses. 
There's a point, though, where Jesus says that some of you are going to call me Lord, Lord. You're going to use my name twice. You're going to act like that you knew me. You're even going to do things in my name, and you're going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we? Didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? And I say, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. There's another one where Jesus is talking, and he's talking in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, and he says, but why do you call me Lord, Lord? Yet you don't what? Do the things I say. You don't obey me. He says, you're trying to invoke intimacy, but you don't love me enough to even obey and do what I told you to do. That's, that's rough to me. You know what that tells me? That this walk with Christ is way more than just what you do. Amen? You can do and do and do and do, and we see people in the church that do and do and do, and they keep on doing, and he says, you can call me Lord, Lord, but if you don't do the things I do, you don't actually love me, and if you don't actually love me, you won't enter heaven. So God equates your love and intimacy with him by being obedient. Woo! But we've taught in the church, grace, 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 grace covers everything. Right? We want, we, we want to say, well, uh, God knows my heart. You're exactly right. He does. And you know what the Bible says about that heart that you claim God knows? It is the most evil thing about you. Ouch. Right? We, we've taught in the church that, that just come as you are and, and everything's going to be okay. Yes, if you allow God to change you. If you allow God to give you a new heart, God does not want you to come like you were and stay the way that you were. You have to be different. You have to be obedient. He's calling you to a more intimate relationship. Not that you do so you can get saved. You do because you are saved. You with me? There's, there's, a, there's, a, a, there's an, I guess, I guess a, a symbolism there and, and if you're not married, maybe you, you won't understand this, but I'm sure that you probably will. You know, it is very true that I can be married to my wife and I don't ever have to kiss her. Y'all agree? Amen? We may not be married long, but the marriage is not dictated by the kiss. But my kiss, sure enough, better be dictated by my marriage. I should want to kiss my wife because I'm married. You should want to obey because you're saved. You don't look at salvation going, I can work and I can get it, I can do it. No, you work at salvation, you look at salvation and go, God, you have done this to me, so let me come and praise you. Let me come and worship. You know why I can tell you about my Jesus? Because of what he's done for me. That's why I can tell you. And if, you, if, if God has never done anything for you, you ain't never met him. Because he did something for you 2,000 years ago. And if that's all he ever did, amen, that's enough. Right? So he's calling Moses and he's calling you to this intimate, more intimate relationship. And I promise you that if you'll listen, you can hear him call you. Sometimes it'll be in the middle of the day. Sometimes it'll be at night and you'll just hear Chris, Chris, Rachel, Rachel, Derek. Derek, and you wonder, you're like, what is going on? What do you, God, what are you wanting? He's saying, I want more with you. It's great that you're saved, but you realize being saved is just the beginning. There's so much more in God that we can discover and walk through in our relationship. So God is talking to Moses and he's telling him all these things and it gets really good in verse 7 because God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and I'm going to deliver my people. I've heard their cry, I've heard their pleading, I've heard all the stuff that's going on with them and God goes, and I'm going to go rescue them. And if you're Moses and if you're me, you're like, yeah, go God. Right? Then we get to verse 10. In verse 10, so now... 
Go. Wait a minute. <laughs> I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. God is so funny. He's sitting up and he is setting Moses up so big. He is telling him, hey, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to take care of this and I've heard the cry and I know what's going on and I know how to fix it and I'm going to defeat their enemies and I'm going to take care of this and I'm going to move the mountain and I'm going to fix their bank accounts and I'm going to fix their job and I'm going to fix the family. And you're like, yeah, come do that for me. And then all of a sudden God says, now go because I'm sending you to go do it. Lord, that wasn't part of the deal. I, I, I don't know about y'all. I want to watch you do it, Lord. So let me sit down, and I'll watch you. You know that phrase that we use in the church? Oh, my, this ain't even part of my notes, but it's going to come out. That phrase we use at the church, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Y'all heard that? And, and this is how we interpret it. <clears throat> What are you doing, Pastor Chris? I'm just waiting on the Lord. Just waiting. Something's coming. I know he told me. You know what that word actually means? It means those that wait. How can I help you today, Lord? What can I get you today, Lord? How can I serve you today, Lord? Y'all, what do we call those people in the restaurants? We call them what? Waiters, right? This is what we have to do is we have to wait upon him. And so God is telling Moses, I'm going to send you. And Moses comes back with the question, who am I? Who am I? See, you got to kind of understand something about Moses. Moses is in the middle of an identity crisis. Some of you may be there this morning. You think about Moses, Moses... He knew who he was when he was raised up with his Hebrew parents, right? But he was actually raised by Hebrews in Egypt to act like Egyptians. Then he leaves Egypt, the Bible says in Hebrews, and turns his back on Egypt. So now he doesn't have anything to do with Egypt. He doesn't really have anything to do with Hebrews because they turned their back on him. And so now he's sitting in the Midianite camp. Hebrews, Egyptian, Midianites. I don't know where I'm going. Who am I, Lord? Who am I? Who, who are you making me to be? Am I a slave? Am I a king? Am I a royalty? Am I a priest? And then on top of that, everybody's turned their back on him. Anybody ever been there? You make a decision, and the people you thought had your back were the one, very ones that stabbed you in it, right? And so you're sitting there with God, and you're like, I, who am I? What am I supposed to tell the people? Who, who am I that you would send me? Lord, I, I got to know who I am before I walk into the boss's office tomorrow to ask for the raise. Hello? I got to know who I am before I go and reconcile with my parents. I got to know who I am before I can actually turn the drugs away, before I can actually turn the alcohol away. I got to know who I am before I can say no to this relationship that I'm very certain you don't want me in. But before I say no to that, I've got to know who you've made me to be. I've got to know who I am. And so God answers the question of who he is. And just on a side note, just a little bit of a, of a goose egg for you, do you know what the number 40 means? In Hebrew, it's the number of testing. So Moses at the burning bush moment is actually 80 years old, which is 40 times 2. The first time that Moses reached the age of 40 was his first test. He comes out and he sees his people. And he sees who they were and what was going on. And at age 40... Moses attempts to take leadership of Israel, and he kills an Egyptian. And then the Bible says that he thought the people would join him and follow him, but they didn't. They turned their back on him. So the first test was, Moses, do you know who you are? And Moses says, yeah, I do, and I'm going to make it work in my own strength. You say, Pastor, can you give us that in Scripture? Absolutely. 
Acts, 7, verse, uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 22, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now when he was 40 years old, it came to his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptians. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. So Moses, at age 40, knew who he was. Knew what he was supposed to do. But he flees, and now we find him at age 80, and God's testing him again. Do you know who you are? Do you know who I've created you to be? And Moses gives a bunch of other excuses. How many of you have heard that Moses had a stutter? Y'all have heard that? Can I just tell you, he didn't have a stutter. I know. I'm blowing some theology here. Moses did not have a stutter. I can prove it to you. Look at verse 22 again. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in what? Words and deeds. He could talk. The problem was when the first test came up, he failed it. And so then he begins to identify with his failure. Anybody ever been there? I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to say it. I didn't know the words to speak to make them believe who I was supposed to be. So now I can't talk, Lord. I can't think of the right thing. I'm slow to speak. Not that he has a stutter. He's saying, I just don't know what words to say that will get them to follow me. Who am I? And we do this in our lives too, don't we? Well, I'm Chris and I'm an addict. Are you? Was Moses a stutterer? Well, I'm, I'm Chris and, 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 and I, I just, you know, Lord, I, I, I'm just afraid to talk in front of people, so I, I, I can't preach. What if, what if they don't listen to me? What if they don't know uh, what I'm saying? What if I can't articulate it? Well, Lord, I can't talk to my neighbor because, you know, I don't really have all the answers. I, I'm, I'm not really very learned in the Bible. I haven't really studied it all that much. So, Lord, I can't go do the thing that you're asking me to do because I have this limitation. I am identifying and labeling myself with the limitation that I see. Who am I? And God's response is, I am with you. Let me say that again because that should have warranted a little bit of a response. God is saying to you, I am with you. You are not limited by your past failures. You are not limited by the thing that once defines you. You are new. So no, you, I am not Chris the addict. I am Chris born again, blood bought, never going to touch the stuff, never going to fall in that again. So don't continue to label me by that. Don't continue to hold me to that. And you can say, well, well, I ain't really, never really been an addict. Yeah, but you've been something. <laughs> Hello? Like, uh, Christians are real quick to get amnesia about who they used to be. And so we want to begin looking down at people. I can't believe they would come like that. I can't believe they dress like that. I can't believe they talk like that. Well, it wasn't three months ago, Miss Sally, that you were talking like that. I hope there's not a Sally in the room. That name just really came to me. And if there is, I am so sorry. Um, but Moses knew who he was supposed to be. But because of his first failure 40 years ago, he lost his identity. He lost who he knew he was supposed to be. And so he's coming to God and he's saying, God, I need you to answer that question. He had a relationship with God. He had intimacy with him. But he forgot it because he failed and he got stuck in the failure. He got stuck in the test. And see, we, we love, there are some of us in here that are still, how many of you are in school? If you're in school right now, college or any other, raise your hand. Going to, going to school and taking tests. What is the number one rule for taking tests if you're inside the classroom? Silence. Don't talk. Study before, but when you get in that classroom, when that test hits your desk, 
what does the teacher say? Everybody be quiet, no talking. What does the teacher do? Gets quiet. So you come to God and you say, God, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do in this situation. I'm kind of stuck. I really need your help. And there's silence. God doesn't give you some new word. He doesn't give you some <laughs> hand on the wall. You're waiting and you're like, God, I, I really need you to talk. I, I really need you to tell me. See, here's the problem. When you're in the middle of the test, the teacher's quiet. God has been training you for this moment. He's been teaching you for this moment. And you're reaching out for God to give you the answers. And like a good teacher, he's already given them to you. You just need to obey them. And God is not going to give you a new word until you obey the last one. Right? So we see this moment. He's coming to God. He's afraid of who he is. And, 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 and he has left Egypt. And by the way, he did not leave Egypt because he was scared of Pharaoh. He left Egypt, the Bible says, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured seeing him who was invisible. He had a relationship with God. He tried to go in and do what he knew God was telling him to do, but he did it with his own strength, and he killed the Egyptian. God never told him to do that. And when it doesn't work out, then he flees. So don't ever think that Moses was afraid. Don't ever think that Moses was scared. The Bible says that he left because he knew what God was going to do with him and he could not figure out what to do next. He had a relationship with Christ. So next verse, Exodus 4, 1. Then Moses answered, but behold, they will not believe me. And this is the, 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 the third excuse that we have. They will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. How does he know that's going to be their response? Because it was their response the first time. Again, Moses is stuck in his moment, in his failure. He is stuck where he failed and I'm just here to tell you that the devil is the accuser, not God. The devil is the accuser and not God. So let me just go ahead and give, uh, uh, give our saints a message. If you walk around with your finger out like this, you are doing the devil's work, not the Lord. But we get real quick to accuse people, right? Oh, I know what they did. Oh, I know where they were. I know what happened with them. You used to fill in the blank. You used to talk like you used to do this. See, God had made Moses the ruler over the Israelite people, but they knew him as something different. You're the guy who murdered the Egyptian. You're the one that did this and so they responded with what they saw in the physical to Moses and so we see in that excuse he's taking on the accusations of the people so we go on then Moses said to the Lord oh my Lord I am not eloquent neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue this is where everybody takes this verse and they say see Moses is a stutterer that doesn't mean stutterer what that means is he could not think of the words to say to get them to believe. He was slow of speech. That means he tried to give them words. He tried to give them the thing that, they were, that he wanted them to believe, and they didn't believe it. And so when they didn't believe it, he made it personal. Well, it must be because of me, which is why they don't believe. How many of you have ever done that? Well, it must be because of me. They won't, they won't talk to me. It must be because of me that our relationship went sour. It must be because of me, because of me, because of me, because of me. God's redeeming your history, and he's calling you to something greater. And when God redeems your future, he has also redeemed the history of which you walked through. You hear me? He's calling you to something deeper. So what you do is you look ahead and you think, oh, that's going to be great when I get there. Oh, when I move over there, it's going to be awesome. When I get to that position, when I get to that place, that city, that state, that whatever, it's going to be so awesome. And God's saying, no, 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 no. I've redeemed the whole thing. So the journey to there is also awesome. 
the journey to get there is also great because I've told you that I'm going to be with you from the beginning to the end. So it's never not great because I'm never not with you. And God is calling you to something greater. You are not your issues. Let me say that again. You are not your issues. The issue is you're taking your eyes off of him and placing them on you. And so when you begin to do that, you begin to fall into the things that you want to do instead of what he wants you to do. And he's calling you to something greater. He calls you his. Y'all understand that? God, almighty creator of the universe, calls you his children. Don't you dare diminish the sacrifice of the cross and say, well, I'm just. Hear what I just said. Anytime you talk about you and put your, like we used to have this saying when I was growing up and I, and, and it, I thought it was funny then because I was a kid, you know, but I look back on it and I go, wow, how horrible of an idea of the value that we have on our lives. And the saying was, well, I'm just the gum on the bottom of God's shoe, yet he saved me anyway. What? Like, I, <laughs> you mean to tell me that God Almighty decided that the gum on the bottom of his shoe was worth his son dying for? I don't think so. I think you got a little bit more value than that. You're, the value that is in you is based, is based upon the sacrifice to purchase you. And you realize that you were purchased by blood. And so that means that your value is imminent. It's eternal because the eternal God came down to die for you. So don't ever go to God and go, God, I know I'm just a low down dirty sinner and I'm not worth anything. But if you could just no, you are his son. You are his daughter. You are of a royal priesthood. You are in his family. He says you come to the father and come boldly because of my blood. So you walk into the throne room. God, your father, is sitting on the throne. You need to interact with him. You don't come down like this. You walk into the throne room. Jesus, I love you. Thank you so much for my sacrifice. Hey, uh, Dad, here's what I really need from you today. Hey, how are you doing? I love you so much. Thank you for everything. And you tell him what you need. I get so fed up with the, and, and hmm, don't hear what I'm not saying. There is a reverence for God and who he is. But he has told you, you can come boldly to my throne. I promise you, you would never see the prince walking into the throne room to talk to his father like, Dad, I know I'm nobody. Boy, you better get your head up. You are the son of the king. So that prince would walk into the throne room and everybody else would shut up. And you realize that God has, am I allowed to say shut up in the front of the pulpit? I'm sorry. I said it twice. My goodness. So, let's move on. You have Christ within you. Act like it. Act like it. Amen? Verse 12. So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be the sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. So he says, I'll never leave you. And just in case you're wondering if it's going to happen, when you get to the place that I have sent you, you'll know that I've sent you there because you'll come back here and you'll worship me. Woo. So we're going to worship him on the journey and we're going to worship him when we get there. If you are waiting until you get to heaven to worship God, you will never make it. Hello. Hello. If you are waiting to worship God until you get to heaven, you will never make it. So you better start now. Like, that's why I came in here and, you know, I, I'm, I'm loud, obviously. And so when I go to worship, I, first of all, I'm going to sit on the front row at every church service I go to because that's just who I am. But I'm going to sit over in the back and try to sit or sit over on the side and sit away from everybody because I'm loud. I like to worship. I think if I can go to a Titans game, I don't know, and, and a Vols game, and if you're not a Vols fan, just it, it's okay. We'll pray for you later. 
if I can go to a Titans game or if I can go to a Vols game and leave out their horse because I've been screaming so much, heaven forbid I don't give the same enthusiasm and energy to my Lord and Savior. Hello? So that's why I can't just come into a worship service and, and praise the Lord. He is so awesome. No, you're going to know who I'm praising. Amen? So you better not wait to worship. I'm getting ready to land a plane. Worship team, if you'll come on up. We amen things like this all the time while we're in church, when we're in service. And we, and we hallelujah, and we're like, yeah, that's good stuff, good stuff. But the thing that happens as soon as we get in trouble when we leave this building, we go, Lord, do I, 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 do I have to complete that? Do I have to do what you've asked me to do? Do I have to, do I have to go where you've asked me to go? Is, is this the place where I'm supposed to, to, to get up and do the thing? And honestly, it's never about do I have to, it's that I get to. No, you don't have to do what the Lord says to a degree. But you get to do it. And you should want to do it. And you should understand that when Moses asked God, do I have to, do I have to complete this? Do I have to, to do this? God says to Moses, throw down your rod. He says, what do you have in your hand? What, what is that thing that you have with you? Because see, so often we're all the time looking at what we lack, and Moses has given God an entire list of all the things that he has lacked. And God says to Moses, what do you have in your hand? Throw it down. If you will be willing to take what you have and cast it at the feet of Christ he will do miracles with it and you get to participate you get to watch so, so you say well what does that mean well it means you cast your job down God all I got is this job I, 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 I know I'm not a pastor or I'm not an evangelist or I'm not on the worship team all I have is my ability to sow I can make some curtains. Well, then you do everything you can do with those curtains as if you're doing it for Christ. And God will give you the opportunities to minister. Well, all I can do is, 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 is I'm a teacher, so I just go into the classroom. And really, even I go into the classroom, they've kind of tied our hands as teachers, and we can't really talk about you as much. He says, if you'll just cast it down at my feet, I promise you I'll do something with it. And if it comes down to it, would you be willing to let the job go for my sake? Well, that's my only income. I know it is, but I'm also called the provider. Amen? So we got this moment. I told you I'd give you something. Because there's no excuse that we have. And God keeps on going and keeps on going with Moses. And finally, Moses relents. Because Moses finally realizes that if God is with me, then there's nothing else I need to make it happen. So we see that God asked Moses, he says, take your shoes off for you're, you're standing on holy ground. And I told you, I searched and I searched, man, I could not figure out for the life of me why we need to take my shoes off. I'm standing on holy ground. And then I came across this story. And this story tells us about a man named Boaz and a lady named Ruth and a lady named Naomi. And you've probably heard this story before, but there's really one interesting part of this story that I think if we don't read the Bible and we just read the Bible, we kind of miss it. And so I wanted to point that out to you. So then Boaz said, on the day that you buy the land from Naomi, Boaz is talking to the Redeemer. He's talking to the guy who is supposed to take care of all the issues. He's supposed to be the one to come in. He is playing right now in our story the part of Moses because Moses thought he was supposed to be the guy. Moses thought he was the deliverer. 
And so Boaz is talking to this guy, and he says, On the day that you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with a property. At this, the guardian redeemer, the kinsman redeemer, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption of the transfer of property to become final, one party would take off his sandal and give it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal. Say, Pastor Chris, what in the world does that have to do with the story of Moses? Forty years earlier, Moses kills an Egyptian. Why? Because he thought he was the redeemer. He thought he was the one to rescue them. He thought he was the one to deliver them. He thought he had to be the one to stand up against the Egyptians. He thought he could do it all on his own, and he failed. So when he comes before God and God stands here, he says, Moses, I need you to do one thing. Before you come talk to me, I need you to realize one thing. You're not the redeemer. I am. Take your shoes off. Take your shoes off. See, you're not the one to save yourself. You're not the one to deliver your friends. You're not the one to save yourself or or get rid of the addiction. You're not the one to to stop all the sinning. You're not the one that can, can, can live the life that God has called you to lead. But if you'll take your shoes off and say, God, I am here. You are the Redeemer. I give you control. I make you Lord. I'm not going to do it anymore. He says, now I've got you. Now you're at the point of success. Now you're at the point you know who you are, and it's not God. That's my title. So I wonder today, do you know who you are? And do you know who he is? I think there comes a point, even in our Christian life, that we have to make the decision, God... I've tried walking this thing for too many years with the shoes on my feet. Now, today, I'm going to take the shoes off and place them at your feet. And I'm going to finally give you control. Stand with me as we worship. If you feel the need... If you're sitting in a moment right now where you're like, God, I've been in this place. I've been been trying to keep control my entire life. I'm now turning it over to you. We want to pray with you. There's a prayer team up here. If there's not, y'all come on up. Because I'm telling you, if you'll take the sandals off, if you'll relinquish the title, And you trust God, no matter what's going on, your past will be redeemed, your future will be redeemed, and your present will be redeemed. Because he is that good. Amen? Let's worship.
Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus, shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family. The holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the street, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Bow with me, please. Lord God, thank you. Lord, thank you for the ability to shout Jesus' name. Lord, and to know that we're heard. so many times, God, that we put ourselves, that we, we use that word, I, I'm this, I'm that, I can't this, I can't that. Lord, I just pray that, that we all remember who we are in you, God, and that we have the ability to shout that name, Jesus. Lord, as we go out now, I just pray that you lay that on all of our hearts, Lord, and as we, as we go through this week, Lord, that you arm us with the power of that name. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.